Welcome Spartans to Podcast of Vols Book Club. I am your host today, David, and with me is the full house. We got Krista Brown. Hey! Orin Demang. Hey, everybody. Aaron Campbell. Hi, guys. Check it out with the full names, peoples. We're here. We finally made it. We are going to talk about Halo, the Fall of Reach. Wow, it took us a while. Yes, it did. It's a scary book. This book only came out last year. <laughs> What it is 18, it's 19 years of age. It can legally have alcoholic beverages in Ireland. It can do all sorts of awesome things because it's so old. And because it's so old and because of the time and it, that it was made and who made it and who wrote it and it's all sorts of craziness. This was the first ever Halo book. I famously did not know it existed for many, many, many years. That there was even any Halo books and my cousin got it to me. And I was like, what the fuck is this? And she's like, it's a Halo book, you like Halo? And I was like, yes, this is crazy. And we read it and everybody loves it. It's probably one of the biggest books out there in the Halo kind of community for its impact, for its kind of controversy, which we'll talk about a little bit for a little bit. Before we get too crazy into it, guys, uh, I would like to thank our patrons because you guys are amazing. Thank you very much for like all of the amazing stuff that you do. You support us. You make these things happen or at least make it easier for it to happen. So you guys are, you guys are amazeballs. Thank you very much. So we have Halo Fall of Reach. Krista, do you want to take us through the particulars? There's quite a lot because since Halo Fall of the Reach is so old, it's got a lot of different things going on. So the title is Halo colon the Fall of Reach. Not even the, it's just Halo Fall of Reach. My book really? is the, yeah, fall, of the fall of Reach. Oh, mine's the Fall of Reach too. Someone wrote this wrong. <laughs> Halo colon the Fall of Reach. Author is gorgeous, beautiful Eric Nyland. Brought us this beautiful book and one other. We're very happy he did that for us. Two others. Oh, there's a couple different. There's a couple different publishers because the book has been published multiple times. Del Rey Books or slash Orbit U in the UK slash Tor Book t- slash Tor Books is the 2010 edition. And then the gallery books is the 2019 edition. Like we said, this book's only a year old. We're not that far behind, right? Yeah. Formats available are ebook, paperback, and there is a audiobook, but it's still for the original. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, they never remade the audiobook. I think we know one of the guys who does those. Maybe we should talk to him. It was weird, though. I was listening to the audiobook for this, and listening to some of the things that I knew was like, quote unquote, wrong. I was just like, oh, I really should try to read the actual book. <laughs> a lot of wrong pronunciations, because interestingly enough, the book I have kind of has a the making of in the front of it, where it kind of talks about how this how this was kind of put into creation. In terms of the definitive edition of the novel? Yeah, this is the, I have the 2019 version because I just bought it for this. And there's like a cute little synopsis that kind of talks about where this came from. They were on a crazy deadline. I think it was like six months or something turnaround. To get the original out? Yeah, to get the original book. And this book was made when Halo Reach, or not Halo Reach, the original Halo was being made at the same time. They were being made at the exact same time. So Eric Nyland had to work with a lot of Bungie was being really quiet because they were busy. So communication wasn't great and stuff like that. But Against all the odds, the book actually turned out to be brilliant and amazing and actually kind of encompass everything that Bungie wanted it to be, which is kind of great. It's actually a really good excerpt. I might take pictures and send it to you guys so you can read it. It's like four pages. When you say that, it makes sense then with some of the things they have in this book because they keep talking about ships and the Pillar of Autumn and its rotating sections. And I'm like, that ship's got nothing that rotates, but clearly he didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's different parts to that. I mean, how they talk about even the technologies that humanity have doesn't quite match what we know the technologies that humanities have at that time. So, like, there's all sorts of crazy day jumps. I mean, you can't get too harsh with the book, especially given that piece of information, Chris, which is fascinating. Because, obviously, when Halo was being made, that was a pretty crazy time. And to try yeah. and write a book in that time and have it come out to support, which it pretty much did. It came out 2001 to support the launch, which is crazy. Yeah, because the original came out came out October 30th, 2001, right by the launch. So this book was being made as the game was being made. 
I don't know how how they got it done so well. It was so it's so nice. Like even with some of the um, inconsistencies, it's so nicely written and it fits really really well into the Halo universe. Yeah, it's a very interestingly writ- written book, and it is also fascinating from the perspective that it's not. There, it's kind of hard to say that there isn't a main character, and and it covers way more than you think it should. Okay, it's called Halo: The Fall of Reach. If you're playing Halo, you don't know what Reach is. Uh, it's never really been said back in the back then. You knew it was a planet. I think it was hinted somewhere along. In Combat Evolved, one of the first in Keys' opening monologue, he mentions Reach. Yeah, I was about to say they jumped from Reach, and I think that's about all you knew, really, kind of going in. So like, it, it's just crazy to think about what it was like back then to to try and f- piece it together with this book. The, the like, where do you go with this information? Okay, it's about it just cover. Oh, oh God, I'm getting tongue tied. It does crazy stuff. We're gonna get into the sections. The sections are quite handy and quite useful, and how we're gonna discuss this. We're gonna go section by section because the book is very useful for that. And like you said, the amount of pages and the length of the pages changed based on the edition and stuff like that. And a lot of kind of extra content got added in some of the later editions. And again, they went back essentially. So I'll probably start talking about it now. So. There are multiple editions, like I said. The original 2001, you had August 2010, you had June 2011, and then you had March 2019. So the definitive edition that came out in June had a lot of corrections around dates and times, and that was obviously supposed to kind of help tie in Halo Reach, that the game that came out in 2010. <laughs> I mean, that caused havoc when that, when that game came out. That was one of the biggest things that, okay, the game itself was great, people loved it. But the dates and times and locations of events mess with people's brains. And especially with, like, how this book ends does not match up at all with the events <laughs> that take place in Halo Reach, the game. Especially where that game ends. It, it, it hurts it hurts our small brains to, to, to fit these things in. And they just pretty much don't. And that's just unfortunate. And that's just the way it goes. Where 343 didn't exist. This was Bungie. And I don't think I got the impression Bungie didn't have a whole lot to do with these books it was probably something pushed on the microsoft end but anyway here we are we have 340 pages 2001 but we could get a 464 pages in 2019 which probably it makes sense based on what krista said with some of that extra synopsis stuff there's also a bunch of extra stuff in the back it's adjunct which is like a bunch of communications and stuff like that here in the back yeah that came out with the 2010 release but it was obviously kept up in the um definitive edition yeah none of them are particularly of interest either no not really because i took a quick look at in there because i didn't actually obviously didn't know they existed there's things like only communications things that just hint at other things happening around the same time links to different characters that show up later on all that kind of stuff i i read them and i'm like this would have been interesting if i didn't know anything about what's going to happen next in the Halo universe, because most of it's like, oh yeah, I know that's going on. Oh yeah, I know that's going on. Yeah, and also some of them kind of flesh out characters in the Halo Legends kind of anime, which is weird, but obviously that was probably get based around the same time where they were trying to nicely kind of fit all these different mediums together. Guys, let's get cracking. So, like I said, the controversies were around dates, times, and locations characters that were in places that didn't make sense based on where they were in the games so there's a bit of overlap and a bit of kind of difficulty there um in how they actually overlap there is obviously wikipedia is awesome there is some great other resources out there to kind of help you put this together i will shout out to halo canon because he put a great video like kind of helps put these things in focus guys halo reach fall of reach there is a prologue which myself and Chris were kind of talking before the show doesn't really mean it do anything I guess, based on where you were at the time of 2001, you thought you were the only Spartan. The book kind of pretty much kicks off showing you that there's way more. That they work together in teams, that they have different colors, there's codes, they have, they're incredibly efficient. They're kind of trying to sell you that they're a badass, straight off the bat. And it has them kind of running around, taking out banshees, fire, you know what I mean? They're taking out grunts and jackals. They're on a system which I think crops up a few times, a place called Jericho 7. It's pretty much... It does some kind of character building because, like, it pretty much sets off the bat in the Halo universe, something that we kind of know from for reading other books, that on the ground, humanity is actually pretty decent. And even with the 
severe differences between technology humanity can actually come out on top and spartans are a big reason why that is but no matter how good they do on the ground it's the space battles that actually determine the fate of a planet so and humanity is constantly getting itself its ass kicked by the covenant and it's scary so it pretty much shows at the end of this, the prologue is pretty much chief watching a planet get glassed am i right yeah that's pretty much it and it's kind of just the impact of what that is of watching a planet get destroyed by an alien race this book has a big weight to it which is the fact that humans are losing this war they're being systematically wiped out one planet at a time there's just nothing they can do they're just constantly losing and it's obviously a threat that humans are being extinct they're being driven to extinction is kind of what i'm trying to say it's a genocide yeah, genocide. The prologue just kind of kicks it off at that. Don't worry about it too much. Not really a whole lot happens here. Um, there's a few other characters introduced in terms of the different teams. They they talk about red, blue, and green, but the composition of those doesn't really matter. So you may be thinking, hey, blue, I know blue team. Well, blue team can be pretty much whatever Chief thinks it wants to be. So like, it's not really set in stone. Yeah, Spartans kind of move from team to team and become team leaders. It, it, all, it all, as you learn through the book it all depends on what kind of mission it is also as the game goes on it just depends on who's still alive or the book yeah (laughs) sometimes you become team leader by default so yeah it's also you kind of learn a little bit that spartans have obviously different specialities and some of them are better some things than others so team compositions will change based on that so anyway the prologue starts off with the 12th of february in 2535 i'm not going to say too much more about it just obviously that's many many years before the first halo ce takes place which was 2552 just so you know we're going to be throwing a lot of dates at you today guys so uh, if it's hard to keep up totally we understand it it's also hard to write them down the next section of the book is a section called revel which i had an interesting piece of trivia when i was looking up what is that and where does it come from right that word the first section of the book is titled revel It involves characters emerging from cryosleep. The first section from Halo Combat Evolved is also called Ravel and also involves Chief waking up from cryosleep. Oh. Ravel is is a traditional bugle call of the US military, which is sounded at the start of each day on the military installations to wake up the troops. There you go. That's what it is. It is the French word for to awaken. So there you go. And I think the pronunciation is Reveille. Just so, Ooh, Reveille. Just Thank so you very you much. Know. I don't do the Frenches. I barely do the English, to be honest. Reveille opens up on the 17th of August, 2517. So you're kind of going, holy shit, this is an early ass date for Halo. This section is pretty much setting up these characters, ones that you probably are familiar with, because we get straight and much introduced to a Lieutenant Junior Grade Jacob Keys. Jacob Keys, <laughs> and he's really nervous right now. <laughs> this is one of the first books that really fleshes out Jacob Keys as a character, which is awesome because he was cool in the game, but not for long. <laughs> and then there has been a series of books that came out uh, that all feature Keys in different places, and he's always awesome. But it is great to see him in his kind of early days and in kind of his youth, and kind of really some of the character building done here is really really good. There are things that happen that aren't actually mentioned in this book, but has significance later on in terms of some little bit of sex at time. You know what I'm saying, Christopher? You know, you know what I'm saying, guys? Yeah, off screen. There's a, little bit, there's a little bit of that going on. Some young doctors. Yeah, he's looking at ladies. He's like, oh, look at that Halsey as she gets out of a cryopod. <laughs> <laughs> so the book introduces straight away to Catherine Halsey, who is... Like we've said before, one of the huge biggest characters in Halo who didn't show up to the game until the game Halo Reach, but obviously existed way back in 2001. This section is pretty much setting up the Spartan program and how it kind of came about was actually really kind of cool. There's loads of details in here about like the different characters and only like how she how she got away with it, essentially. What you have to think that in 2517, the Covenant haven't been discovered yet. Humanity is gearing, tearing itself apart in various kind of insurrection wars and rebellions halsey has a plan in place of what what needs to happen to get the outer colonies in line is either a huge military presence there'll be a lot of deaths a lot of civilian deaths and she's thinking no i have a better way to do this so she's going to essentially create super soldiers how is she going to do that she's going to kidnap some kids 
Uh, of course, that's the first place you look for super soldiers. This is where you start. I need super soldiers. I'll go get me some kids. <laughs> this is the first kind of big controversy, and it still is to this day, like one of the biggest kind of hardest things uh, in that Halo touches on in terms of like child soldiers, kidnapping, flash cloning. This is really glazed over in this book, too. It is like, yeah, it happened, whatever. They touch on it a bit, to be honest. But like, I guess when you think what this book is trying to do is sell you kind of the game. Do you know what I mean? It's getting you the background of the game. It's not going to go crazy. I mean, later books delve into it way better and stuff like that and touch across, obviously, the ramifications of what Halsey has done. And that's still never ending. Keys is a bit easier on it than I think. He, he should be. I feel like they mentioned it just like they mentioned it a couple of times in Halls. He's like, I might be a bad person. No, I'm not. And then they sort of go on about it and it like it takes years to really dig down into this was severely fucked up and Halsey's not a nice person. Yeah, definitely with the the discovery of the covenant and the fact that how well the Spartans do kind of helps gloss over that a bit. Do you know what I mean? They are very quick to kind of cover up the bad parts and look at the good parts. We have these super soldiers and they're amazing. Isn't that a great thing? As opposed to their origin being so pretty horrible. Yeah, like I think they, they're they saying this, like the Admiralty doesn't really warm up to the Spartans until like, oh, you can kill alien things. And you're really good at it. Pretty much it's a cool section where it obviously builds up the character of Halsey and she's amazing she's amazing all throughout this book I love her I've always loved Halsey but this is the first book I read of her the first thing I knew of her was from this book and it really sets the tone for this pretty amazing amazing person as terrible as her actions are I still think she's amazing her interaction with Keys and her interaction with pretty much any character is is pretty damn good to, to be honest I, I've always loved her dialogue and her quipping if her like confidence her just like arrogance um, is kind of intoxicating to get behind Especially when you see her going in and dealing with a room of military types that she just isn't, she's not intimidated at all uh, and does a wonderful job building up keys as being such like a boy scout kind of, do you know what I mean? In terms of like he had, he's, essentially she picked him for this mission to be her like chaperone because she's going to scout out some of the children. She picked him because he can keep it secret. He's not going to say anything if he's told not to. Yeah, which is a pretty big deal considering that he's scouting going checking out a bunch of kids that are going to later be kidnapped and he also doesn't know what's going on halsey's like we're gonna go we're gonna go do something at this planet you're gonna keep quiet about it and not say anything but she did her best to kind of make sure that he didn't figure out what was going on and when he started to figure out what was going on he she immediately was like okay you're done yeah you're reassigned exactly what i do want to talk about in this section really is one of the big things is that halsey and keys go and see john they go and see John on his home planet in his school. And it's a pretty iconic scene of John is playing a game called King of the Hill. Oh, where have we heard that before? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> he's a bully. Essentially, he's bigger than he should be for his age. He is stronger. He loves to win. He's very competitive. And he always wins. So Halsey is pretty much pretending with keys to be like parents coming to visit the school because they want to enroll their kids. Which is kind of a cool scene because... Um, Keys is so awkward and he, uh, outside of his uh, uniform, he doesn't really like using it. He's kind of awkward and stiff around Halsey. It's kind of cool. Essentially, he's just left to watch and record as Halsey goes and interacts with John in terms of like, she watches him beat up all these kids and throw them down the hill. And it takes like three kids to get him off and he like bites them. It's pretty, pretty physical. Yeah, very physical, very aggressive. Not at all a nice child for the image that, that it paints. But it, it's, it is pretty cool because she kind of calls him over and says i want to play a game with you and she kind of flicks a coin she's wants him to guess if it's heads or tails well and also like he's never seen a coin in his life coins aren't used anymore exactly essentially she was testing for something that she can't test on paper or remotely which is a thing called luck and this is a interesting thing that i t- i like that it's factored in it's always the thing about john where they say it later he's not the strongest spartan fastest he is, in fact, the luckiest. That's his trait, essentially, which is the reason why he is what he is. And I kind of love that, that about him, that that's, that's his thing. Because how do you measure it? But you don't. You go and meet him and he says, like, you know, he always wins. He's not allowed to play all these other games because he's so good and I imagine aggressive at them. A thing called Grav Ball, which sounds kind of interesting. Um, but he's just not allowed to play anymore. So it, it's, it, is, it is cool, this kind of meeting and interaction, especially to see... 
a child like that and we know what he becomes in the end the book kind of leaps in dates so you don't get a real sense of progression but you you see it in, in moments and flashes and stuff like that that's kind of really it it kind of jumps down to a later date he's he's six years old by the way he's six years old which is kind of important but essentially this section also covers well what they do they they don't really go into the huge details but hope they have i one of the kind of interesting kind of comments that stuck out to me is that they have funding for 150 candidates or they have 150 candidates but they only have space for 75 or i thought they cut funding was it i can't remember what it was did she said we have 150 and we need to scale back to half that number because either we don't have the funding possibly let's say or the, the resources I think it's that, yeah, they just have the funding for the 75. That's their their cutoff point. So Halsey's had to come up with a way to, like, wheedle the children How out. How do I whittle this down? Yeah. Which is cool because you think they would go back then later on to the other 75 and take them in. And maybe they did. I don't know. Well, they, they probably grew up before. Oh, that's also true. Actually, you know, maybe, yeah. it, it took a, they didn't do augmentation and kind of getting ahead of it all, but until they were teenagers, so. Now the six-year-olds are teenagers, so they probably... And Anyway, but yeah. They go out and kidnap a whole bunch of kids. <laughs> it is just kind of glossed over. It's just like, oh, now there's a bunch of kids now. And then later it explains that it's Flash cloned, but unless I forgot somewhere in the book, but I don't think it was in the novel where they described that the Flash clones were no. like cloned with a defect to like have them just die after a certain amount of years. It's touched on vaguely, yeah. Yeah, about the fact that they were flash cloned with, let's say, not perfect cloning. I can't remember the exact wording, but it is mentioned. I think, yeah, it's something like defective cloning defective flash like clones or like early dying flash clones, something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's very, very subtle. Yeah, but it, it again, I'm kind of getting blank because it's overlapping with other, other content that we know fleshes that out Um, and it was done deliberately. But that's the scariest part of that is kind of glossed over in, in, in this book. There's a, it's a cool sequence and it's mad that the picture, but Halsey is there. We're introduced to a character named Chief Mendez, Franklin Mendez, who is an awesome character as well, by the way. And he is the, he's a military. The drill sergeant kind of a drill sergeant, character. Exactly. He's in charge of essentially the training program that is going to make these kids Spartans. So 75, six year olds essentially are brought in. Halsey is really nervous. She feels really bad. She we're introduced to a character called Deja, who is an AI. So she is, in fact, a dumb AI. So that is, if you're not too familiar with Halo, it means that she is designed for a specific purpose and she works really well within those parameters. But she isn't like, let's say, she's not Cortana, which we'll get to later on. Yeah, she's not She's not like a free-thinking AI that can do a multi- multitude of things. And Deja was designed essentially to train Spartans, to train these kids. So that's what... We have these kind of these key characters essentially like they just popped up a little, little bit now and again, but she's not all too important to, to the major story. Uh, other like Mendez and Halsey. But there is a lovely scene where I know Halsey is talking to Deja about like what she's decided, what she's going to say to these kids. They thought about lying to them and they thought about like saying, oh, your, your family are killed by whatever insurgents. We're going to train you to fight insurgents or different ways that they were going to try and indoctrinate these kids, which is a real key fact because they are indoctrinating these kids. That's the reason why they took them so young, essentially, because they want them completely loyal to UNSC, because what they're actually designed to do is to put down the rebellions that are projected to happen in the future. Halsey has decided, no, I'm going to tell them the truth, tell them why they're here and why we took them. I appreciate that. I know that was probably, yeah, they made it on her side, like it was a tough decision for her to do, but she says no, because it's too risky to backfire against us if they learned that we lied to them at the start, which which actually makes sense. Well, and her speech is just so short and sweet to the kids as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the truth, let's say, quote unquote, that she comes out with is just a bunch of like fancy one liners. But again, you're talking to six year olds. Do you know what I mean? So like how how much information can you give? But I do like it. They flash between the certain kids and stuff like that, that they're like, they don't cry. Do you know what I mean? That These kids are special. They're they're above and beyond. They're more than normal humans are anyway. They have like various genetic markers that were looking for different things and stuff like that. But they are highly intelligent. And the section pretty much ends there. That's that's kind of it. Do you guys have anything to add to that section? I know it's, it's kind of short, but it, it is kind of key because there are other content comes back later on to these dates and these times and kind of fills out 
like we said, the cloning, the actual kidnapping. We've seen kind of different videos, even stuff have been made of what that actually looks like. And I don't know, are you guys anything out there? The kind of big takeaway is to see the Keys and Cortana relationship because you see more of that in this novel and then it develops in other mediums. And then you just get the classic origin story of your hero. And so this is this is literally where John came from and the the first steps that he and those other you know, eventual Spartans took. So it's it's about as origin as you can <laughs> make it that then just really sets up this whole next section uh, for the boot camp. The thing I appreciate about this first section is that they mention the fact that Halsey kind of hates herself for this. Yeah. yeah. She acknowledges here because some people get very upset that 343 highlight how monstrous a thing this was. But even back then in this first book, like she acknowledges and goes, oh, maybe we shouldn't do this shit. And then she's like, nope, nope, we're going to do it anyway. But like she still acknowledges and goes, maybe I'm the terrible person. I think she even says, I am the terrible person for this. Yeah. I think she knows that. It's probably something she wrestles with for most of her life. I mean, we know, actually, we know she does. Because even in the latest content, you can see what she's become and how important John and the Spartans do are to her. We won't touch on it, but there's a thing called Halsey's Journal, which came out with the Halo Reach game. And that's amazing. It's very magical. It's very magical. And it fleshes loads of stuff out in these books in terms of interaction with keys and stuff like that. And various parts of the project and there are things touched on in this book which the journal fleshes out way more which is fascinating to technology and stuff like that and different things that, that crop up I, w- I won't take too much because we're not going to say too much about it there well we'll go through it eventually that journal d- deserves its own episode it sure does i need to people get one what else have we got so the next section is boot and it kicks off the ex- this essentially the next day after the previous section so we're the 24th of september 2517 all he had pretty much said to mendez that as the kids were being kind of brought out give them some food and put them to bed but tomorrow make them busy keep making them make it so that they don't know what we've done to them is it it's a great line and essentially that's what mendez does so it's about these kids waking up in the morning by drill instructors i think we've all seen movies and tv shows that show like military training and you know how brutal it can be Imagine it's a six-year-old and it's pretty damn harsh that these trained they're going in with stun buttons and everything and <laughs> tasing these kids, getting them out of bed, getting them running. They put them through crazy exercises and these kids are already physically better than let's say most humans, but like not to the extent that the trainers are putting them through. It's a crazy day. Then they have to go to quote-unquote classroom where Deja teaches them about the Spartans of the famous 300 story of Thermopylae of how 300 Spartans held against thousands of Persians. So obviously that's where some of the naming convention came around for Spartans. So like it makes sense that you would kind of touch on that because you're going to have a small number holding out against a much larger number for the rest of their lives. It's kind of what they do. So it makes sense to ingrain that indoctrination into them early. Then she says, tomorrow I'll teach you about wolves. Then they go to the playground, which is essentially a obstacle course of crazy mental brain of frank lamendez of the stuff he comes up with to torture these kids i love how like they say playground and john's like oh good i can finally relax yeah i'm gonna sit on a swing and have a think about myself and no no we do not it's an obstacle course yeah but we get introduced to a few other characters here now there is obviously way more spartans that are ever actually named in this book and even today we don't know all the names of all 75 very convenient for filling in when you need a new novel Yes, very convenient. You can pull a Spartan out of your back pocket somewhere. What we do have is introduced to at the start because this obstacle course is splitting up into teams. This is the first sense of where you can see they're building teamwork into these guys because obviously these are six-year-old kids brought from all over the, the galaxy together in one place. They introduce Kelly and Sam, um, which is kind of weird because if you're like us now and you're starting, maybe Halo Reach is not your first book, um, and you've played Halo 5, there's a good chance that you think you know what Blue Team is, and then you get introduced to, no, John's original friends, first friends, was Kelly and Sam, that he was introduced to here. Kelly's thing is she's fast, and Sam's thing is he's strong, and John's thing is he wins. <laughs> I mean, it's it's very dumbed down, but yeah, that's exactly how it is. It's great. Yeah. I love it. This segment pretty much breaks down into them being told your team have to go ring this bell it's on this big pole and the last team 
of every member of said team to ring this bell gets no food. You get no food. So John's like, this is great. I'm going to win. So he has no interest in these two guys and he immediately runs and rings the bell. I think he's the second or third person to ring the no, bell. No, he's the first, I think. Oh, was he the first? Oh, he was the first. Yeah, he he gone. He gets, he rings the bell and he comes back to Mendez and says, oh, I rang the bell on number one. And Mendez has a little smirk, writes it on his board and that's the, that's that. But because he didn't help his teammates, they come in last. They ring the bell last, he gets no food. And this is the big lesson for John, where he has to realize that it's not all about winning. Well, it's not all about him. It's you only win if everyone wins. Yeah, when your team wins, everyone wins, do you know what I mean? And when one of your teammates lose, you all lose. And this is a new concept that John used to learn, that it's about teamwork and stuff like that. So Kelly and Sam are very not happy I with think it. Sam sucker punches him, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. I think he does, yeah. Again, we'll skip ahead a little bit now, but the training sequences here are kind of cool and it kind of fleshes a whole kind of stuff out. These characters kind of eventually team up with each other. They get better. They learn about wolves in terms of like how to track and kind of like kill as a team and stuff like that. And how like you can bring down something much heavier than yourself if you work together, just reinforcing these kind of team tactics. So in the next time round, you get the same teams as before. Kelly, John and Sam work together to essentially win. And that's like a great obviously learning moment for john and the rest of them and then eventually they become friends high five freeze frame in the chapter then it kind of cuts a little bit it cuts for like it goes it jumps two years and goes to like around july let's say 20 25 19 and the spartans are essentially they're eight years old as you can imagine they're being dropped off uh, in the wilderness they were each given a bit of map they're just kind of fired away and called okay you have to make yourself back to base the person who comes back last isn't getting has to walk home essentially and they're out in the middle of nowhere yeah they get like left behind and i think everyone gets scattered so then because they because eventually when because at this point john's kind of made himself the de facto leader leader. um and so but you know over the course of these past two years everyone kind of rallies behind him and looks for his leadership and so yeah after they get set in they all get their mat piece and then they all have to find each other and they use their their fancy little codes that they've uh, come accustomed to and eventually regroup to overcome this challenge. Yeah, that scene in this, they call it a pelican, but we know now it probably wasn't one because there's about 75 kids in the back of this thing. <laughs> I think the later versions call it an albatross, which is kind of a slightly larger version of a pelican, which would make sense. Mine called it a pelican, I think. I think mine called it a pelican. It's probably more like a condor. So I this is just in Wikipedia. It says the dropship used to transport the seventy five Spartans. Chapter five was originally identified as a pelican whose troop bay would be far too small for seventy five people. In the reissue, it doesn't say which one. It says the dropship was changed to a larger albatross. So I'm not sure which reissue that could be in. Krista, was it a pelican? Uh it, I'm pretty sure it said pelican. I can go back and check. Interesting. Uh, not to worry. Oh, you know what? I was listening to the audiobook. That's why. So of course it said the pelican. You got the old version, my friend. So this scene, I'm going to just kind of skip over it a little bit, but it is cool to see, one, the scene in the Pelican, all the dropship. John identifies the river. He has like a secret code that he gives to the team. The team kind of disperse. They all accept his orders. They know exactly what they mean to do without a word being spoken. That's all cool as fuck. Because obviously the Spartans are working against the trainers. And obviously they've learned over two years not to trust them. And they're being bred, essentially, to work together. And it's, it's a cool scene. Very quick. I love it. Everybody is dropped off in the wilderness and they eventually meet up together at the river. They put together their map pieces and figure out where they are, where they have to go. One, we're introduced to a new character kind of here, which is um, Fajad. Fajad, yeah. Fajad. And James and Linda are also introduced in this section. So Linda should be sparking off alarm bells in your head. because She's the lovely Linda. And we also have Fajad and James you don't hear too much about. But we'll, we'll get into their just characters for this book, essentially. The team gets together, but like they're all looking at John, okay, who's going to be last? And John says, no one's going to last. I'm going to figure this out. Which is cool because straight away you're getting the sense of he has an idea of what leadership means to a certain extent. And he's kind of taking that on board of like he doesn't want any of his team to lose. That lesson has been really ingrained in him. A lot of the way things are written about John in this book is very animatronic. And I think that's on purpose. It's all about winning. Do you know what I mean? It's always talking about winning, losing, winning, losing. But that's the terminology that's obviously been ingrained in them. John really takes it to heart. And that we've seen that at the beginning anyway. That's just kind of who he is. And I think the later kind of stories and fleshing out John of kind of what, ha- what happens when he does lose and how he deals with it. Anyway, keeping on going. The guys 
make their way through the wilderness. They find the pelican, but it's got a bunch of dudes outside it who don't look like they should be there. They're not in uniform. John doesn't trust anything. He kind of does a cool sequence there of sending Kelly out as bait. Sam pretending to be hurt and stuff like that is kind of cool. And then they pretty much beat the shit out of these guys when they realize that they're not nice people and commandeer the pelican. John kind of figured, ties into Deja, asks her, asks her to teach me how to fly a pelican. And she's like, hell no, but push that button and it's on autopilot and I'll bring you home. So that's essentially how they won. And then there's a very quick sequence of John being in the office with Halsey and Mendez. And he's like, how the hell did you do this? Who told you to do this? Why did you do the things you wear? And John very much robotically rattles off. They weren't in the uniform. They weren't in regulation. Blah, blah, blah. They didn't act the way they were supposed to act. So we just did what we had to do to win. And, and it was kind of cool. And she's kind of, how do you punish him? And she's like, punish him? No, we make him squad leader. As an, as an eight-year-old. As an eight-year-old, yeah. That's the kind of thing you got to think about. These guys are eight years old. So the the book version I have does have it as an albatross. Oh, does it? There you go. Cool. John says, I'm in an albatross drop ship. There's no pilot, but I need to get home. Teach me how to fly it, please. Cool. There is another time gap that pretty much shoots ahead to 25, 25. So now we're getting close, guys. The, I'd say the majority of the book is, is two separate years. It's probably 25, 25 and 25, 52, would you say? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, the, a lot of the events take place in these two key years. So those are important years for Halo because in 2525, that's when we got contact with the Covenant. And in 2552 is when Halo CE kind of kicked off. So these are kind of two major events where the Halo was first discovered. All three of the, the first Halo games happened in 2552. And that's actually correct, which is crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. <laughs> I, I forget that a lot. <laughs> And then there are time jumps in the, in, the, in the later games. I think we're we're in 2560 now, aren't we? Yes. Halo 5 ended at 2558. Yeah. Halo Wars 2 is 59. Wait, is it Halo Wars 2 is 2559. Yeah, yeah. And then I think Inf- Infinite was 62 or something like 61. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of years in, in there. I think it'll look up. But anyway, more on that much later. <laughs> The start of this kind of section, I see section, but where we're still in boot, the boot section, we're in 2525, 25, and what is happening is Spartans are, what age are they now? About 14. 14. So now they're undergoing augmentations. So there is a cool scene of Halsey reading a report that she asked, obviously someone who taught her, but he is essentially, yeah, okay, here's the current status of these type of projects. And the risks associated with them and what you can do is it or yeah, the risks associated with them. So it's a cool ass report, which very bleakly tells you how horrible things are going to be for these kids, what they do, because he's saying these are theoretical, right? Yeah, well, she's like told him they're going to do it on chimps or something. We're using monkeys. It's totally fine. I don't have the specific name in front of me, but it's horrible in terms of like, we're going to make your bone more denser. But here's the risk of you, your bones like overgrowing do you know what i mean and like causing elephantitis and stuff like that and then there's like things that we're going to do to your like various glands in your body and eyes and stuff like that eyes and stuff yeah that's it like in terms of like you could go blind and all these kind of horrible things but obviously she's going to do them all but um she was kind of talking to Daisy. she was hoping that there would be advances in technology by now to kind of reduce the risks of associated with with these things because the augments that they're giving the spartans it's horrible so they do a whole series of intense surgeries on these kids and it's where the significant losses come from and it's pretty goddamn horrible. My favorite thing is right before the augmentations, Halsey's giving John his mission because everything he does is considered a mission. Yeah. And he's like, I'm, I don't understand this mission. What's going on? How do I win? And she just says, survive. It's just like, oh shit. Their bones are being like made denser and there's their muscles are and reflexes are all being kind of Yeah, their brains up. or brain chemicals are being messed with, like all this all this crazy shit. Yeah, they're doing a lot of horrible stuff to these kids. Carabide, ceramic, ossification, advanced material graph and aesthetic constructions make bone virtually unbreakable. Muscular enhancement injections, increased density and decreased lactose recovery time, catalytic thyroid implants. This is a pellet containing growth hormone catalyst. This is the one it suppresses sexual drive. That's what kind of like looks like. Ooh, that's an important thing where people kind of misinterpreted 
this a lot. And there's parents that want to have sex or they can't have sex. It's not that they can't. Their drive to do so has simply been suppressed. That's just something to remember. Their ocular capillary reversal. So this is the whole thing to increase blood vessel flow and increase the rods and cones in the back of your eyes. Superconducting fabrication of neural dendrites. So this is the whole messing with your brain kind of stuff. Incre- 300% increase in reflexes. That's kind of the key stuff that they're doing to these kids. And the risks are insane. It's disgusting. <laughs> Like, just listening to it is just making me queasy. I'm like, oh. Yeah. As you can imagine, this is one of the kind of most horrible moments in the Spartan program where we have 33 successes out of 75. 30 kids die. 12 of them are crippled beyond repair and are unable to continue. We don't have the full list of 30 names of who died. We know one or two. Well, we know. I think we have one or two names. I can't remember the top of my head that were killed in this process. There's never been a roster released of, like, everything. It's weird. It's kind of weird how much we don't know, but it's, like you said, it's definitely, like, pocket Spartans, like you guys were saying. Yeah, it's very useful. They can they can pull out. I, I want to say maybe we know about 15. No, we know more of that. Do we? Of the 30, of the 33 Spartan 2s? I mean, I, I, we should have looked into it, but I'm I'm confident, like, almost... I don't think 100%, but I feel like we're close to identi- ha- some form of identified who each, every person is. I, I, don't know, I don't know if we could just add a name to a Spartan, give him a backstory, and give him his or her own story. I think everyone's more or less accounted for okay. in the universe, with, with maybe the expe- exception of the 12 that have been crippled, because we know of a few like Soren. We only know like maybe 16 of these 33 Spartans. I think so, yeah. And then the Unable to Continue ones, they're also very interesting because we have, obviously, Saren Osman comes out of that, that group, which is amazing. And, you know, Fahad, Fahad is still continues on in the story and stuff like that. So this is obviously horrible. There is a funeral scene, which is pretty touching in terms of, like, Mendez giving a speech and the Spartans watching. It's kind of like ejecting the bodies out into space. And John is, like, obviously totally distraught over this. There are people, other Spartans in like floating tanks watch, watching the funeral procession and other people in wheelchairs and stuff like that. And when the handlers kind of take them away, John steps up and says, don't move them. They're part of his team members. Do you know what I mean? They're part of his squad. And then that's where Mendes has come over and explained to them that they're still part of the team, but they're going to, they their minds are so sharp, essentially. So they give them other jobs as data analytics and stuff like that. So that's where these names crop up still. Mendes pretty much teaches John about like, price of spending a life and you know you obviously don't want to waste a life for the wrong reason but you as a leader it is your job to know when the correct moment is to send someone to their death and why you do it is important and that's also a key thing that crops up again and again in this book oh you guys have anything to add here not to this it's yeah i think you pretty much got it all it's a tough scene but after the scene comes one of my favorite scenes i love this scene <laughs> I've mentioned it before, it's pretty awesome. Um, it is on 2525 aboard the Atlas, which is this military kind of space station that they're on, essentially. Or is it a ship? Yeah, it's a ship. It's a cruiser. Yeah, you got the argument. So they're, they're on the ship now, they're kind of training and kind of they're doing kind of R&R because they have to learn how to do everything again, how to walk, how to move. Their reflexes are so much faster, they're not used to their bodies now again. There's a scene where John goes to a gym to work out. And this gym is designed in such a way as different has different gravity types. It's a spinning. It's a spinning section of the ship. So, like, it creates gravity, but at the same time, like, the left side of the ship might have denser gravity than the middle of the ship. It's like a it's like a cone ship. I think they describe it. They describe it as yeah, describe it as a cone. But so I think the gravity is higher the further away up the cone you are. John essentially realizes it doesn't feel normal in one G, so he goes to the higher G and he feels oh yeah okay now he can do crazy amount of reps and stuff like that. But now. He was kind of doing calculations and stuff like that. He was dropping this pin because he's think, oh, this, this the gravity must be wrong. How am I able to lift this weight? Like, I think it's not the weight; it's the it's the punch bag. The punch bag moves at the wrong speed. This is what throws him off. The bag is coming; it's moving too slowly, and he's like, "This doesn't seem right." So he goes and takes a pin from the weight set and drops it on to see how long it takes. And he performs a whole bunch. It's kind of cool. He pours all the calculations in his head to figure out is the gravity working correctly. He realizes it is. But when he's doing this, these three ODSTs walk in. And they're already kind of described. They, they sound like scumbags, essentially. 
they're not portrayed as being nice. They're the black daggers, aren't they? I'm going to find out because I'm really here. No, they're not. It says, though this teaser, Trishan tattoos, burns under arms, drop jet jumpers, hell jumpers, the infamous 105th. Essentially, these ODs come in, they lift off these weights, they fall down, they get really aggressive with John for, like, messing with them. John is really nice towards them, but he sees them, he has trouble kind of, like, recognizing, okay, you guys are super aggressive, but you're on my team, so what's my mission here? How do I how do I deal and address these people? Uh, one of them, a uh, leader, comes in and says, hey, stop messing with this kid and get into the boxing ring and sort it out proper. And the ODs are like, hell yeah, we're going to beat the shit out of this kid. And then John's like, okay, now I know what I need to do. I know, I'm so ha- super happy. I have a mission. I have objectives. Again, it's kind of weird to see how he is. And that's the whole point that he's not normal humans because at this stage, they've been so heavily indoctrinated in how they think. They're just not processing in terms of like, they don't have human emotions the way we would. And that's, that is good, good to see here. Between this John and Halo 4 John, I think it's really Cortana that kind of normalizes his thinking after a while, just because she has a, such a civilian attitude. And a human attitude as towards, and that, that's why all all of the thing in Halo Four is so amazing, and how it kind of how she unravels the robot of John and to make him human and stuff. And you can see that this is where they were building the robot of the Spartans. Essentially, it's touched upon loads in this book, where all the comments about them in armor and stuff like that, as well, how robotic they are, and how dehumanized they are, and how maybe alien the humans look at them at against and stuff like that. This scene is amazing because now John murders three ODSTs <laughs> brutally in this boxing ring. And by murder, I mean actually kill. These men are dead. Like, really, really dead. Like, they start, they start like, one of them dies and then the other guy's like, okay, I'm going to hit him with this, you know, one of the weight poles. And then he's like, he takes it and he just, like, jams it on him, like, hits him over the head. The The best thing about this is, like, when the commander who told them to get into the ring with him is like, Oh shit, he's one of those kids, right? <laughs> and he's like, ah, oh, fuck. Mendez comes in right when John murders the last guy. Pretty much immediately takes over the scene. He says, you, this the, the sergeant, you're to report to Oni for debriefing. That guy's going way far away. <laughs> that guy's dead, Chris. So they got rid of that guy. He's long gone. Mendez's scene with John here is fascinating where John doesn't understand what the ramifications of what he's done, the seriousness of it. And Mendes is like, holy fuck. <laughs> holy fuck, you killed these guys. Yeah, and he kind of talks to John in terms of like, John's like, it's a mission, right? There was a mission, there was a point to this. And Mendes was like, yeah, yeah, sure, son, you're okay. Go uh, go, go have a shower. And it's it's interesting that uh, John just immediately never thinks of it again. He just didn't, he doesn't factor in at all what he had done or even the importance of it because they were bad guys, they were neutralized, end of story, move on. That is important to see that's where the Spartans are coming from. And I, I love it. Because Mendes never reprimands him or something. He's like, what ha- what happened? Master Chief explains what happened. You know, I was in the ring with them. I was told to spar with them and I sparred with them. And he's like, all right, then you did a good job. I know they go on to explain it in other media later, but isn't this, do they explain in this that it's a setup from the beginning? I know when they do the Fall of Reach cartoon, they make it blatantly obvious that this was a test. Oh, really? Oh, I never knew that. In the cartoon, I think Halsey and Mendez are watching the video footage of the fight as it's happening. Oh, like it's live? Yeah, and I feel like in this, it's a little less hinted at. Like, they they tell the ODST commander he's got to go and be debriefed, but by the spooks. But I don't think they hint at it as much that, like, this is... I think they've settled on now. Like, this is a set-up fight where someone wanted to test him against a couple of seasoned ODSTs. How'd those ODSTs draw the short straw? Like, holy shit. Cool scene. Moving on. We are going to skip ahead a little bit. So we're again, the Spartans are now back on reach. They're back training. There's a cool scene where Halsey is uh, like, obviously she's been away. She's not been involved in the training, day-to-day training. She's doing like all crazy Halsey experiment stuff. So she's coming back to check up on the Spartans. There's so many cool lines here with Mendes is explaining to her that like, we have to change what we were doing because the positive effects of what they've reached is like way above and beyond what was projected to actually happen and Halsey's like oh man it must be some kind of symbiotic compounding of all these kind of benefits we've physically given them all working together to create something that's far greater all of the augments to them has made them above and beyond better than what they expected yeah and Spartans are just way too tough now they kill three instructors on the first day, I think. 
Yeah, I think the Kelly kills somebody. Somebody kills him for, for like pretty much. I think it might have been even Linda was training and pretty much killed her instructor. All accidental deaths of like they can't train these kids in combat anymore because they're just being killed. So they give them mech suits. It's mental. Halsey sees these mech suits and she's like, "Oh, is it to give them more of a challenge?" And Mendez is like, "No, it's to protect the trainers." <laughs> yeah, it's to protect the trainers from the Spartans. And there's a cool scene of Capture the Flag where he's like, we dropped them in this cave, like, was it like two days ago? I don't know where they got rope from, where they get all these things. They start, like, messing with the, like, cameras and shit. Every time they hide it, they find it again. Yeah, it's like, whenever we put the cameras, we find them. So there's a great scene of, like, the Spartans pretty much destroying the trainers. And they're all armed with, like, auto cannons and mech suits and, like, all sorts of crazy weapons. And, like, it doesn't matter, the Spartans with nothing with these black skinny suits on this wreck shop and they're punching and beating the crap out of these mechs barehanded the best setup about the whole scene is when mendez is talking about them afterward and he described he's like i've never seen a group of soldiers work like this before and he sort of goes like it's damn near telepathic and you're just like you know secretly mendez is freaked the fuck out going like oh fuck oh yeah yeah what have we created i love that but the the basic like statistics here is they can run 55 kilometers per hour lift three times their body weight and they have 20 milliseconds of reaction time it's pretty insane but the reason why halsey is here to check up on them is because they need to move the next phase because she is now aware that the covenant have been discovered and harvest has been pretty much wiped out they've lost contact with harvest the book kind of ramps up now because now you think okay the spartans are really 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 needed now um but that information isn't really given out just yet so the Spartans get their first real live assignment. So Halsey pretty much comes in, uh, pretty much asks Mendez, will they kill? Do you know what I mean? Are they, will they kill on order? And he says, yeah. Well, even that, like, I think he says, the more challenging the objective, the higher the morale is. They actually really love the challenge. So they get a, their first mission is essentially to go and infiltrate the insurrection in a given place in the home. I think it's John's home system, Iridanus or Idrani or something like that. I think it's John's home system. There is a rebel base they never found. It's in an asteroid belt. It sounds awesome. The Spartans have pretty much been told, we need you to go and capture the leader. So we introduce a new character called uh, Robert Watts. And he's the leader of the insurrection. They're pretty much told that, okay, you need to take this leader out. We've been saving this mission for a while until we really needed to do it. And right now with the discovery of the Covenant, we need to like essentially nip the insurrection in the bud because we've got bigger fish to fry now. So the Spartans are given this mission essentially go and capture the rebel leader and take him back alive and they're pretty much given a bit a lot of leeway in what they want to do there's a cool segment okay john realizes that for this mission i don't need 33 team members i only need four so he picks his team you get sam kelly linda and fred that's right people fred is now introduced yay we have almost the makings of what is blue team except with this this outsider of sam oh he'll be taken care of shortly <laughs> 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 yeah it's, 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 it's yeah this mission's cool the guys they sneak into a ship and they go into like the water tanks and pretty much sleep in there and they kind of get themselves smuggled from a planet on into the rebel base it shows loads of the team members doing different things and pretty much plays into the fact that the just natural intelligence of the spartans how smart they are how kind of kelly figures out from the manifest that they have very special goods, like here's a bunch of cigars and like champagne and stuff like that. And they realize, okay, yeah, that's probably going somewhere important. So we should tag it and follow it. So that's pretty much what they do. They don't really have a whole lot of intelligence of the place. So they're kind of cool in terms of like they don't have like crazy armor, but they talk about these kind of armored kind of black kind of suits that they have. And that will just stop some kind of knives and bullets, but not really crazy. Nothing mental. And they take a bunch of weapons, so you, they talk a lot about, like, the uh, assault rifles they have. It's all silenced weapons and pistols and stuff like that, and knives. The mission is pretty cool. It's done really well. They, It's really kind of short to the taste. It's really, like, I say, like, dirty and fast. Do you know what I mean? They, they just literally get in, kind of disguise themselves as kind of dock workers, pretty much follow the tracer that they put on the, the box to the barracks. They pretty much break their way in really fast, um, really brutally. They murder... Anybody they come across, not a problem. A lot of murder, murder, murder. There's a cool scene of them kind of, they're doing it all totally stealth, by the way, which is pretty, pretty cool. They go up the lift, they break into the Watts' kind of place. They He's there conveniently. John murders the shit out of everybody. They 
take Watts, pretty much knock him out and bundle him back into the box, then they pretty much get the hell out of the dodge. It's pretty simple, to be honest. And then they get... Well, how they get out is actually pretty cool. And actually, one of the main reasons I kind of brought this up is Sam pretty much blows the dock on... The, they're inside an asteroid. Sorry if I didn't mention that. Hollowed asteroid. The big city's in there. It sounds actually pretty dope. Sam blows the docking bay doors open. John and the rest of his team kind of uh, steal a pelican and get out. There is an interesting moment here that I wanted to touch upon. Uh, John actually thinking about the morality of what they've just done. That the other door is blocked off the dock from the rest of the interior of the asteroid. But countless people, uh, a lot of dock workers, there were relatively, let's say, innocent people were killed. There was a lot of collateral damage to which other Spartans don't even think about. John actually spends a moment here, which I think is interesting, of the impact of what he's just done to the people that he murdered. He kind of says he doesn't sit right with him. There's an element of him thinking for himself here in terms of he was given pretty free license to complete his mission and he just murdered a shit ton of people and to get to get it done. Did you, anyone else pick up on this? You guys think? I, I just really, I really liked him thinking about it, especially at this stage. Uh, anything else you want to add about the mission, he guys? He gets shot in the middle of it. That's the probably the biggest thing. John gets shot trying to cover Sam, which will come back to haunt him later. Yeah, which is important. Uh, that is actually pretty cool. I like the first use of biofoam as well. From that, it pretty much confirms that um, the Spartans are as great as they think they are, and pretty much they get the go-ahead. And I'm pretty sure this is the graduation, right? Yes, November 2nd. Yeah, so pretty quickly we were sorry, we're also introduced to another character, Admiral Stanforth. And he is he's a pretty cool dude. He is uh, in pretty high up obviously in the UNSC. This is where uh, the Covenant are kind of brought into it more and it's interesting to see how they obviously studied humanity for a period of time. They're very quick at uh, like adapting to human technology and stuff like that, which is interesting to think about because they never really mentioned that much in the games. It's normally the other way around that you see like humanity eventually getting the upper hand here and you see that throughout this book there's a lot of the struggles of humanity to adapt into the covenant and how terrible humanity but i'd say terrible how bad humanity is doing uh backwards engineering covenant tech and stuff like that and just how difficult they actually find it in comparison to the covenant and how well that they they actually do so essentially they we have the statement of your destruction is the will of the gods and we are their instrument it's pretty harsh it's pretty harsh because this is where now the spartans are pretty much okay you've proven your worth let's do it let's turn let's click the switch you guys are alive let's say uh you you graduate you complete a boot camp essentially so john gets a promotion and mendez pretty much says goodbye and gives john his coin and there's a statement that you know john never saw mendez again also mendez says he's going to train the new set of spartans yes that's what i wanted to touch on so this is 25 25 mendez is pretty much being whisked away to train the new set of Spartans. You're kind of thinking, what Spartans? What else is going on here? But it, And John himself never really thinks about it, that obviously they're creating other Spartans in the background. I don't know if he has been introduced yet. He may not have been, but there's a Colonel Atkinson, who's another character, and he's pretty important in terms of what he does. So I think, do you think this is Spartan 3? It has is to it, be. It has to be, right? It has to be Atkinson's you, uh, Spartans. No, this is this is in between because he goes to train the Spartan 2s or the next class. Then they pull the plug on it and Mendez reassigns himself to active duty. He he goes back on the front line for a couple of years and that's when oh. Ackerson picks him up because he's actually gone back to fight. Yeah, yeah. They, they uh, Halsey tried to do a class 2 of Spartan 2s, but that ran into issues. I can't remember... I think I think they touched on it very, very briefly in the Ghost of Onyx before they talked about the Spartan 3 program. I think it's Halsey's too fussy about like the criteria for the next bunch of Spartans and in the end they can't settle on anyone. Yeah, I think, well, I think the problem was that because the Covenant are here, the galaxy's in such chaos, Halsey doesn't have a, a big enough pool to get the perfect kids again. Like she wants all the she wants all this specific genetic criteria that just isn't widely available anymore. So they weren't able to fill enough spots. Yeah, and it took them and it took them almost ten years to train them before the augmentation. So I bet that also had something to do with it. To where 
Because the, weren't the Spartan threes more loose and they kind of expedited their training and their augmentation to kind of make them ready to fight the Covenant since the Covenant War was going on? Well, in Spartan threes, they just took whoever could possibly yeah. uh, volunteer. They were just like, any kid, any kid. Yeah, grab him. There is another scene that's the last one in this section, I think, before we get to section three. Yeah, we are. We are... I'm going to try and be a bit faster here, guys. This is a long-ass show. This is a cool scene where they go to SETI City 4, which is a planet that has a specific installation on it. And they're going here to get their armor. And this is the most awesome level up RPG moment of a game. <laughs> where you get your sh- you're getting your shit together. There's a cool segment where the ship that they're on gets under attack by a Covenant ship. They pretty much get their ass kicked and the Spartans have to drop off with Halsey, land on this planet and quickly get acclimatized to their suits. It's a cool scene of like obviously the Mjolnir, what the armor is, what it does. It's pretty damn cool. Obviously the Spartans really take to their armor really fast. There's cool moments of um, the ship combat is really well described as well. I kind of, I love the, how that's how that's been done and you get the sense that john obviously hates being on ships because he's not in control and nothing he can do he's at the mercy of everybody else and he's, he's uncomfortable with that so the spartans go down they get their meal their armor and there's a cool thing where they're shown uh when they try to put the armor into normal humans and how the humans pretty much kill themselves because of how fast the armor ups their strength and reflexes that they didn't have the mental capacity or the physical ability to control the suit and you can't turn the suit off it just is on all the time and that's what it does so the suit is made up of amazing components of like a top layer and a bottom layer uh, of various terminologies for different armors and reflective coating Uh, it's important to note at this stage there are no shields there is just the armor that essentially boosts your reaction and strength time and is obviously sealed for the vacuum it has its custom communications but because essentially John puts it on and falls in love, essentially, is what yeah. it is. And all the Spartans <laughs> love it. It ups everybody's abilities. It ups them everything. It becomes like a second skin. It's got all this kind of cool components to it. It's awesome, essentially. So you get like, uh, I do love the scene of John trying to salute and pretty much punching himself in the head. My favorite scene, like our moment, and I, it might be one of my favorite moments in the whole book, is when right after Halsey shows them the video footage of other Marines trying on the suits and snapping their wrists and stuff like that. Halsey just says, um, are there any volunteers? And every Spartan just like stands, like takes a step forward and raises their hand. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> so good. <laughs> Go get your armor, guys. So John realizes um, they're going to have to relearn a whole bunch of things because every subtle movement is amplified. So there are method of communication where it would all be hand signals and stuff like that would have to change. But it is cool because he says pretty much within like 30 minutes the, dar- the Spartans have like fully adapted to their suits they have a new comms um, way of kind of communicating now because they have like personal comms that can kind of it's really like the su- secure com-, com channel that they can talk to each other inside their helmets and stuff like that the situation in space is pretty terrible the ship is getting its ass kicked but they need to get off planet again so Halsey and the Spartans are back in they I think they have they said don't they have something like just like 40 sets of suits so they have one for every Spartan and one and a couple of spares and they take all this gear they are sending I don't know what ship they're in it says a pelican but it may not be because it sounds ridiculous with all these Spartans but you've got 30 Spartans all in their armor going back to the space and they're trying to get the pelican to meet the ship essentially while it's still under attack by the Covenant frigate and the Covenant frigate's kicking his ass so John is like screw this I have an idea we're going to attack this ship and Halsey's like, oh shit, no you're not. And John is like, no, we have to do this because if we either die in space now, we meet or we take the fight to them. It's, it's, we don't have any choice here. So Halsey pretty much gives him the go ahead. So he pretty much rapidly comes up with a plan of all the Spartans going EVA and trying, because they know that, that there are shields on the Covenant ships. So what they're going to try and do is get as close as possible to it. Because I think as it here, they realize that the shields drop when they fire. He uh, doesn't realise until he's on top of it. He's just hoping he's going to find a way in. When he hits the ship the first time, he like slides over the shield and then he notices when the guns fire, the shields drop and he suddenly has the aha moment. Yeah. And then it seems that of the 30 Spartans that did it, only three actually managed to figure it out like John did or just got lucky enough to actually 
Oh, I was going to say, I don't think all 30 go. I think they send like half and half go with Halsey in the transport. Do they? Okay. I can't really remember. I just I just thought that they just went, right, we spammed all the Spartans and see how many <laughs> ended up. But it, it's a cool moment of John smashing this plan together, then jumping out of the Pelican to into the kind of path of the ship, try and grab on as much as they can. It's important to note that this ship has also been damaged in the fight by Mac rounds. So, like, it's got a big open gash on it. So this is where John is thinking that he can find a gap in the shield there to get in. Himself, Kelly, and Sam are the ones that made it. So this is a cool, really quick mission of them getting inside an alien ship for the first time and figuring out what the hell is this. They meet jackals, they murder the shit out of them. They feel really great about themselves that they can kind of... This is their first encounter with aliens. And the Spartans, I mean, so it's kind of like them quickly learning to fight jackals and what they are and what they can do, where they have the shields and stuff like that. There's a cool moment of them breaching their way through the ships and kind of fighting their way to essentially find something to blow up, like a power source is essentially what they do. Sam takes a plasma bolt shot to the side. I have to say, this book makes plasma pistols sound goddamn amazing. They all do, though. (laughs) They all do. It it is kind of funny to see of just like how the human weapons, rubbish, alien weapons, incredible. Sam gets hit and his armor gets breached, which is an important moment because he was protecting John. He stepped in front of John and took the shot for him. They kill a bunch of jackals, plant a bunch of explosives on something that looks, they found like an energy source that that's like pulsing and they're like, okay, we're going to shoot the crap out of this, throw all our explosives in it and get the hell out. And John turns and pretty much Sam's, you stay here and defend the bomb. And Kelly's like, what? Why would he do that? And then she realizes slowly that Sam's suit has been breached, so he can't go back into space. I'm thinking to myself, there's been later stages. He's Spartan too. He's going to be able to survive in space for the brief period of time. But the story has to happen, though, David. The story has to happen of Sam dying here. So being the first Spartan to pretty much die in combat. So John and Kelly sprint their way back out of the ship. They leap out of it. As it blows, as it blows up, so there's a cool moment of the explosives blowing up inside the shield, yeah. and the shield containing the explosion, which is which is kind of awesome. Before it actually kind of breaches and blows up, thought that was kind of cool. It's a very significant moment of seeing Sam die, of John leaving a man behind to die because he knew he had to, and he, as difficult as it was, that's kind of it. And eventually, like all the Spartans get picked up because they're just floating around in space. The scene kind of ends. Yep. And that's the kind of section. And there you go. Oh, God. I'm talking a lot. Do you want someone else to do the next section? Yes. The vast majority of the book takes place now, which is section three, (laughs) six Maritonas, which is kind of ridiculous. So, Krista, you want to take me through the fact that the dates are all over the place for this? Well, in my book, it was all 2552 going forward. Yeah. And in my book, we're 2542. Well, your book is wrong. Your book sucks. Get a new book. (laughs) so yeah officially we're now in 2552 now that uh going forward for the rest of the book so we're in the year the halo year the year halos happen so we open in july 17th 2552 in a remote scanning outpost there's an ensign he's like oh it sucks here i'm doing nothing uh he notices some covenant ships and is like oh shit and so he lets the unsc know we're um right outside of orbit of the system that has a planet called sigma octanus iv which is four four but he doesn't really notify them i think he just logs it as like an anomaly because he's just like i don't think he kind of just glosses over it but this looks weird here you go guys someone else figure it out (laughs) (laughs) it's pretty crazy and so now we jump to keys he's kind of hanging out around the same area he's like oh cool i'm so glad to be around this area that isn't being killed by covenant He's like, oh no, there's Covenant. <laughs> so Keys does something. This is probably one of the most iconic scenes with Keys. He's on this small ship called Iroquois. It's his first ship as well, isn't it? No, they said it's his first um, command. Yeah, it's he's a, he's a commander now. So he's been promoted to commander. First, first time kind of going into battle. <laughs> a bunch of Covenant ships kind of hang out and say, hey. So Keys takes on four Covenant vessels by himself and wins. Do we want to do we want to describe this keys loop? I have step by step. Step one, he uh, sets an intercept course for the destroyer. Step two, uh, frigates turn to fire their plasma torpedoes towards him. 
Uh, he sidesteps the plasma torpedoes, which misses him, uh, which misses them, and then he reacquires the uh, Iroquois, so he kind of go, goes to the side. Uh, the frigates move to engage him. The Iroquois bypasses those frigates going, going towards him. He then grazes the prow of the destroyer, damaging its shields. And the projectiles are still following yeah, him. Yeah, the projectiles are still following him. That the frigates launched at him before his maneuver. So the Covenant torpedoes hit the destroyer and disables its shields. The second, it, the second Covenant torpedo guts the destroyer. And then the Iroquois launches archer miss missiles to finish it off. Next, the carrier disengages from combat. The Iroquois initiates a gravitational slingshot around Sigma Octanus IV. Now there's a trailing nuke that detonates near the frigates. Iroquois emerges from the slingshot and then Mac rounds the remaining ships. Yeah, Mac rounds the two frigates now that the nuke took their shields down. It's pretty brilliant, actually. Dude, it's so freaking dope listening to it in the audiobook. It's just, oh man. It's, it's very brilliant. So it's, the maneuver is now named the Keys Loop. Unfortunately, even though Keys won this, uh, 34 Covenant dropships do get do land on the planet. Now, at this now one day later, it's July 18th. Captain Keys becomes a captain. We get to see Keys become a captain. And <laughs> it's crazy cool. Now the Covenant are angry. So 10, 10 Covenant ships amass. Uh, the UNSC a UNSC fleet kind of comes to assist at this point, which Admiral Stanforth is in charge of. And he starts taking out a huge. He starts taking on the huge Covenant fleet with this big, ama a massive uh, UNSC fleet. There is this interesting UNSC vehicle called the Cradle, which is literally made to repair ships while they're in orbit. So it like just kind of it's huge and it just kind of encapsulates. Them. It's like literally a square kilometer. It's a giant square, <laughs> and it just encapsulates the ship, and then people just kind of go out into space to repair the ship it's 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 per, they just spacewalks to repair the ship so the unsc start firing at the covenant the covenant start to fire back the cradle the cradle literally puts itself in between the covenant and these torpedoes the cradle just gets obliterated yeah it's it's like it's sad that it had to be done but it as like a defensive counter maneuver it, it makes a lot of sense it was cool, and it obviously let all these ships who had lined up all their Mac guns fire another salvo. Yeah, right which after. Was devastating to the which, which was cool. But it, it was cool to see, like, they were humans figuring out how to get around the shields. That if you staggered your shots amongst all these ships, that you, like, would eventually, the third round would get through a shield, which was cool. Yeah. At this point, Keyes kind of realizes that one of the Covenant ships is, like, not with the rest of the fleet. It's kind of hovering over, it's um in geosynchronous orbit with Sigma Octanus. He's like, this is weird. I'm gonna go kill that ship. He goes and kills that <laughs> ship and- And th this is the ship that he rams into and just blows it up. Yeah, he blows up the ship and he gets this weird, like, tracking signal, some, some weird signal from the ship. He, he's like, I don't know what this is. So after this, the Covenant, like, just suddenly leave the system. They're gone. They're like, bye bye And then that's that's the end of the space battle part of this. In the meanwhile, Spartans are deployed planet side on Sigma Octanus IV to try to get some of those Covenant that have dropped planet side. So we have a lot of Spartans. All the Spartans are deployed. So we have green team, red team, and blue team. Green team's leader is Linda. Red team's leader, leader is Joshua. And blue team is... John, Kelly, Fred, and James. Basically, green team, green team, and red team kind of go off to distract Covenant, while blue team, uh, blue team's objective is to get into this one place that the Covenant have landed, which is this city called Cote d'Azur, and they just need to go. They're just going in and blowing shit up. <laughs> yeah, and they and they do some reconnaissance as well. They yeah, they walk around. They talk to the local locals local military force on there and everything, but their main mission is to get to Kota Azor and nuke it. Red team Red Team is kind of told to go find civilians. They're able to find civilians and evac them. In the meantime, Blue Team go into the city and they encounter they go in the sewer system actually. <laughs> but they encounter like a Huragok for the first time, which is absolutely insane that we actually see an engineer this early on in the Halo lore. 
It is cool, and it's never mentioned again. And this is around the time Blue Team figure out that they're all the Covenant troops are kind of on this one position in Kota Azor, which is the Natural History Museum. Covenant are real history buffs here. They really want to learn everything <laughs> about human history. Yeah, so John's like, that's weird. I'm going to go check that out. And he does and immediately regrets it because there are hunters in there. <laughs> the hunters are really well described here and the moment is like scary as hell. Like when they come across a jackal that's just been crushed and they're like, what the hell? <laughs> and like the description of the hunters sounds crazy. And it's kind of weird to think of them. It looks like that they're like operating machinery and stuff like that. And like they're scanning this rock that seems like pretty normal. And then Chief is like, okay, we need that rock. So he engages with the hunters and does a really terrible job of fighting them the first time. Well, one, James uh, just kind of disappears. Yeah, he gets his arm blown right off. So he, he James gets absolutely fucked by the hunters. Eventually, a hole is in... There's a hole in the Natural History Museum. I, John shoots the floor the uh, shoots the floor around the hunters, so they collapse. And then they push a big thing, a big obelisk, a rock on top of them. That still doesn't kill them. But he's able to get this red case that the Covenant are carrying and grab this strange rock and, like, a laser beacon. And so he takes those... They set the nuke at the Natural History Museum, and they all fuck off. Like, all the uh, Spartans meet up at a specific point, get the hell off the planet, nuke the city. (laughs) Yeah, I love the image of, like, they're leaving, and it's like, oh, there's, like, 200 or something banshees coming towards them. And John is like, don't worry about it, and just flips the nuke. (laughs) (laughs) So they get off there. Uh, Remember the strange rock that actually becomes, like, so crazy important it actually blew my mind when i first read this book we have a little bit of a time skip it skips to august 12th 2552 master chief is back on reach yeah he's just being debriefed on the Cote to azor mission they mention the engineer they mention a couple other things before he goes into the room with all these oni spooks keys is there master chief's like nice to meet you and he's like mm, nice to meet you i i know you He's like, yeah, we met a long time ago, but I can't really talk about it. And he's like, I understand. <laughs> it's cool. He gives him some good advice on like what's coming up next because John now gets involved in a little bit of politics that he's not used to and dealing with people and stuff like that. So he's like been like obviously debriefed and pretty harshly. But it's it's interesting to see how these different military types deal with him and the way that they refer to them as all these automatons and the robots. What do you expect? Yeah, they're really, they're such a dick to him. Like, really bad yeah, yeah they don't mention the names but it's clearly Ackerson Parangoski and I yeah, wonder Ackerson's in here, if yeah. the old guy with the cigar is Lord Hood because he's quite nice about John I noticed that too yeah and I'm sure Parangoski's in there somewhere but she's just not mentioned by name true that would make sense and that's section three do you want me to keep going you want me to stop <laughs> I mean I I can do the next section so the next section's Majolnir, not or it's Mjolnir, not Majolnir, uh, like the audiobook. Majolnir, I I used to say it like that to be honest. So, <laughs> so yeah, like it just kind of continues in with the story, but then we start getting introduced to the Cortana character, and so we're we're with Halsey in her lab underneath Oni Base Castle, which we know from the game. Well, the game is Sword Base. I got the impression that there's two labs, unless the train monorail thing that they took at underneath Sword Base took them to Castle. Either way, like all of this Cortana stuff doesn't line up with the game at all. It doesn't make any sense. This is really where it starts getting all muddied because the events of Halo Reach, the game actually happens before this a little bit and like the early part of August, but you're led to believe that first contact doesn't happen till a little bit. But anyway, so we start getting introduced to Cortana and Halsey starts explaining this new mission that she's putting together and that Cortana will work with one of the Spartans and that Spartan and her will lead a team of Spartans and a new ship with a new captain to do a new mission that's called Red something, Red Red Flag. And essentially, Oni believes that the war, despite the victories at Sigma Octanus, 
the tide of the war is still going very much downhill, and they they predict that within a year, the Covenant will be able to find the inner colonies, destroy them, and then eventually find Earth. So they we need to find some sort of way to either reach a truce or a peace or really hit them where it, it hurts, so to speak. And so they devise a plan to send the Spartans to neutralize a Covenant ship, go to a Covenant planet or home world or large uh, ranking area, capture the prophet that they have deciphered as the leader of the, the cast of the Covenant, and then with the prophets, you know, bargain that truce and whatnot. So this first kind of scene is very interesting because Cortana's flipping through all the files and sees John and is like, oh, he's kind of handsome. He looks kind of cool. Tell me about him. And then Halsey's like, oh, you don't want him. And so they kind of play this fun little game. But it's also kind of funny because Cortana is just a, a brain clone of a sense of, of Halsey. So you learn a little bit of that. So Cortana decides to pick John and they start assembling this team. And Halsey wants to use Captain Keys as the to pilot. Pillar of Autumn, and then they describe the Pillar of Autumn, which I didn't really understand until this reread that I had. That like the Pillar of Autumn is like not a new ship; it's like no. a super old ship. Yeah, it's like very layered. They were describing it, so it has actually like a lot of armor, but it's not really. Even though it gets refitted, it's it's not like a destroyer class vessel um, compared to some of the more modern uh, UNSC spaceships that they have. It's described here as like one of the smallest classes of cruiser, but like it was really expensive to make and wasn't really practical, so they didn't make a whole lot of them. And so it was actually designed, it's supposed to be like sh scrapped, but uh, it got pulled out when the war kicked off pretty much because they needed ships. And it has a unique advantage of being, being able to take so much damage because of the way it's internally built, which makes it important for this mission. Yeah, and it, it, it really, it really does. And I think it's also interesting just like hearing about it with like knowing kind of where the story's going. So then it cuts to a couple of days later and they're back in are they are they back in kind of the same underground bunker that they kind of keep going back to? Yeah, yeah. And Halsey introduced the Spartans to the the the, the next I'm not sure which mark it is, but essentially the next Mjolnir armor suit. Well, before that she introduces them to the Covenant Annihilation Plan A. Eh? Oh, okay, yeah, so they have that briefing, and she explains that plan and all that, and Chief kind of has his internal dialogue of just, like, how are we going to pilot this ship, how are we going to do it, like, none of this has ever been done before, what are we going to be using, and so he, he kind of holds off most of his questions for Halsey. Also, something interesting I found is, like, during this, they talk about how all the Spartans are there except three that are unable to be recalled, which I'm guessing is Red Team? It would be Grey Team. No, yeah, it's, I think it's Grey Team because Red Team is actually not part of the original 33. Red Team is one of the 12 that was washed out but then got rehabilitated. Oh, okay. Yeah, so then it would be Grey, I guess. I think it's Grey Team that they're referring to because Black Team's not here, but Black Team was, again, technically part of the 30 that died because they were the super secret people. I was looking into this when we were talking about it a moment ago. But anyway, so yeah, the three of the Spartans that aren't this, I forget how many are there, to like 25-ish? They've lost a few, yeah. Yeah, and so they, they have most of them. And so they they go there, they explain the plan, that the, kind of the four phases that I just mentioned to get the profit to broker a piece. And then we also have the same kind of moment that I really liked earlier when they're like, like, you know, Halsey says, I can't order you to do this because of how dangerous it is. It's volunteer basis and every Spartan volunteers. Yeah, I love it. That is like what I think Spartan 2s like are. Is that like the, that type of moment? So they all volunteer. Do they all get into the suit or is it just John who gets in it first? They all get suits, but John gets Cortana. Yeah, okay. So they all hop in suits. John gets in, or John first gets like a, a neural upgrade, goes to like a scientist, and they, I guess, make his, his neural implants compatible to like communicate with an AI. Just, just so that her chip fits in, I think. Well, the chip fits into the suit, but I think it's so his consciousness connects to the suit in a better compatible way. So then when Cortana goes to the suit, they can 
have that connection. Okay. Because I don't the chip doesn't go into his head, right? It just goes into the suit. I think it goes into the suit, yeah. And it's just the interface between him and the suit then that is upgraded. Because I think that's already there for when it has other like vital signs and the suit's able to change the temperature of the gel to kind of fit whatever he's going through. So I think it's just an upgrade to whatever that neural implant is. Um, and then we get a return of the Ring the Bell sort of obstacle course training program. Halsey says, count to 10, and then you have to neutralize your threats and ring the bell. And that's like all she says. And so like during those 10 seconds, him and Cortana have like a kind of back and forth, which is really interesting. But then we have another just like kick-ass moment, which is just like the beginnings of the Chief and Cortana relationship, because it's not like 100% compatible off the back, because like John still kind of has reservations about you know, could can Cortana like overtake his suit or like how much control does he really have? How can he really utilize her? It's a different, again, it's another different way of thinking about all the tactics that he's been brought up for the past 20 years um, with Mendez and even learning the first suit that he had. And this is also the suit that has shielding. So he's able, they were able to replicate the jackal shield and incorporate that into the shield that we kind of recognize from the game. So some Marines come out or ODSTs come out. So he fights them, kind of basically just punches them. And like, like he, since he's kind of testing the shield strength a little bit, the ODSTs are shooting at him and he more or less just sprints at them and just punches them <laughs> instead of like firing back because he doesn't want to kill them. Yeah, that's a cool distinction that he, at this stage in his life, we've had like a lot of kind of time skips, but he's completely different in terms of how he engages with humanity now. Which I like. Yeah, we need every soldier to fight the Covenant, and these aren't really my enemies, so he just neutralizes them as opposed to killing them. Yeah. No, he still fucks them up. He shoots, he kneecaps a dude, like... He does, he does cripple them, which, which is hard to read when you think about it that way, that these are fellow, like, human soldiers when you're, you know, just training, but, but yeah, at least he, he does take that, le- the lessons he's learned from way back in the, the boxing ring to then now, and all the other sort of stories and missions he had between... 2517 and 25 or 2525 and 2552 but then there's like landmines that he has to find and then there's like podiums he has to jump over and eventually it escalates to where a what type of jet comes um skyhawk a skyhawk jet comes and like shoots a chain their chain missile or their chain rounds at him but then those miss so then they throw missiles at him and he like and then this is when he like he first uses cortana and says calculate this equation for me running past here with reaction time so that I can slip past the missile and tell me when to go. And so she says, okay, and then they do it. And that's like when they first have that that compatibility um, that then they then continue to use throughout their time together. Yeah, it's a cool moment of him slapping the missile away and it blowing up behind them. He literally, he's like an inch away and then just boop, and then it goes away. And this was all orchestrated by Colonel Ackerson and it, he was very resentful of the Spartans, and so he really tried to make sure that he failed. And so that kind of backfires. And like immediately when he rings the bell, Halsey's like, stop, stop, he won. (laughs) Call off your men. (laughs) And then the kind of last segment of this this section is really interesting. It's a Cristana scene, and we kind of get a little bit in the mind of her as she's starting to do like system checks for the Pillar of Autumn, and they're getting ready for this mission. But then while she's doing that, because she's an AI, she can multitask beyond reason. So she starts looking into Colonel Ackerson and looking at like his marriage and his finances and all this other kind of stuff. And he completely, she completely like transfers money into like brothels. She fucks up his life. It's hilarious <laughs> she how really... easily she does it. <laughs> and it, like in the way Eric Nyland just like describes all these like crazy subroutines and back doors that she goes through, it's just really interesting on how Cortana is thinking and f- gaining access to all these things. Because after that, after she does that, she wants to learn more about the Spartans, but then she's hit with all these roadblocks because it's all protected by Oni Section 3 classified materials. So then she continues to go through her ways and she ends up sneaking a like footprint of her, of, of Halsey typing in her security clearances and her retina scan and then using that as verification to access these files. And so she is able to learn about what the Spartan 2s really went through and the training and the augmentation and the washouts and all that kind of stuff. And she kind of really learned that information, but then kind of put it all beside her. But like that, that chapter is just very interesting on how it's 
worded and, and orchestrated because it gives you a glimpse into the thinking and processing power of Cortana. Yeah, it's really well done. And then we get this great scene where we get ready for this awesome mission. We're going to take a profit. Keys is checking all the Spartans. They're doing everything. They're about to punch it. And then one of the crewmen says, incoming message from three- Fleet Clom. The Covenant have found Reach. We need to support them. And then that's where the fall of Reach actually starts. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take to that section. Now, after all these pages of this book, we're getting to the actual fall of Reach. <laughs> For everything else this book covers, the fall of Reach is a small portion of it. But it, it's a cool battle. So I'll kind of skim over because we're going very long in here. A whole ton of ships, a lot of ships, pretty much get pulled back on Reach. Re- Reach has all these super mega Mac cannons. They're called Super Max. They sound amazing. We've kind of seen them more or less before in Halo 2 and stuff like that. Because the Pillar of Autumn is so far out on the system, it's actually way out of range of the battle that actually takes place. So loads of ships come back in. There is, I think, 300 or so ships that show up. 314. <laughs> that shows up here <laughs> uh, that show up and then pretty much this huge battle takes place where the Covenant try and blow up the guns and there's like loads of stuff going on the cradle the different types of cradles are also used again to defend the um, the, the turrets these these Mac cannons going off and destroying Covenant ships in one shot are, is amazing like atomizing one of them is incredible this crazy space battle pretty much happens Pillar of Autumn is running its way trying to get back uh, in the middle of trying to get back, a, slip sp- a ship comes in, and it sounds awesome of how, like, Cortana interface with this ship pretty much, like, wrecks shop, essentially, with the Pillar of Autumn. So we get to see the Pillar of Autumn running at, like, 100% capacity when it's been retrofitted with all this amazing stuff. It has a Mac cannon that fires three times instead of one. It has cool kind of shredder rounds that kind of explode on impact and stuff. It's awesome. It has so many rockets that it's not supposed to have. And there's a cool little battle here of pretty much him taking out a ship and at the same time, humanity pre- kind of like fights the Covenant to a stalemate to a certain point. Isn't there some sort of like super Covenant ship that basically sounds like a beam rifle in space? Pre- yeah, it pretty much shows up and starts sniping out ships, but it actually keeps its distance away from humanity. So like humanity's reckon is actually doing pretty well against other ships, except this one is just sniping a lot of ships. But like the super beam that's just cutting through everything. Then what well, the snag shows up where we have a only kind of stealth ship that was off the grid. So all the other ships in the system have initiated the code protocol and purged all their data except for this ship that was off the grid. So now the and the Covenant find this out. So then they kind of come back to fight Reach to kind of take that uh, ship that's in this dock. Captain Keys has to deploy the Spartans. So John is like, okay, we have to put this. I'll take a team of three to go to the space station and get the ship. All the other Spartans have to land on Reach because the Covenant have managed to kind of suicide drop a whole bunch of troops onto Reach, essentially to take out the power plants that are powering the Mac cannons. So all the Spartans, except for these three, which is John, Linda and James, get deployed on Reach. And we kind of never really hear from them again a little bit. So a lot of them get kind of... um kind of they fight and reach and we don't really know its specifics but there's a cool scene where john and linda and james fight their way onto the space station james gets really just killed off straight away it's it's almost hilarious how quickly he gets killed it's like oh okay i guess he's dead now he gets hit with a needle and explodes and his jetpack flies off and he just flies off the space <laughs> <laughs> what, what a heroic way to die <laughs> I know, it's pretty bad. John faces an elite for the first time here, um, so it's kind of a cool segment there, and Linda and John pretty much blow their way up in with this, like, they have, like, a pelican with all these explosives on it, essentially, that we're going to use to board a Covenant ship and capture it. They have to use it to blow their way in to this space station. Then we're introduced to Linda being amazing with Sniper, as we know, killing a whole bunch of jackals. John struggling to fight an elite, and we get Johnson. Sergeant Johnson has to show up in every Halo book, so he's here. Uh, one of the first book. Um, so he's like one of the Marines kind of trying to defend the ship on the station. There's kind of a bunch of cool scenes of John and Linda kind of killing everybody, wrecking shop. They fight their way onto the ship. They kill it. They destroy its core, this tiny little chip, so that the nav data is now safe. But unfortunately, everything else has gone really bad. The Spartans got overrun on reach. The Covenant managed to destroy the gun, the Mac power. And a whole other fleet kind of shows up then and then starts systematically destroying the Mac cannons that are not powered anymore. Pillar of Autumn has to swing by, 
Linda gets shot really badly. She gets wounded really badly. She kind of goes into a coma and she put it actually she shouldn't go into coma. Linda dies. John essentially <laughs> thinks now that he's the only Spartan left. So he, Linda gets put on ice. Then pretty much John gets picked up by Pillar of Autumn that now has to escape Reach because they have to abandon it. But he's decided that we just have to get out of here and com- try and complete our mission is more important now than ever. The Reach is gone because they've lost they've lost the battle. When they're going out system, they have to generate a random vector. And Cortana uses the rock that they got from the museum. And she figures out that what was they were scanning inside of it was a location, not a message or a language or anything like that. It was actually star formation. So she figures out where that is and says, oh, this is a random location. Let's go here. Let's figure it out why the Covenant want, wanted it. And when she slip space jumps through it, okay, well, just going to say this slip strong takes a period of time. It seems a significant period of time. Uh, I can't remember. Does it say how long? August 30th is when it, when they emerge. So they go into cryo sleep. That's the whole point. Like, why is John in cryo when he was awake? But um, they put him in cryo and a lot of the a lot of the um, the crew go into cryo on this trip. And when they come out the other end, they are at Halo. And this is where they discover Halo. That's pretty much where this book ends and where the game kind of picks up. The book is ended, guys, and that's a whopper of a show, so I thank you for staying. <laughs> I will just say one thing that in trivia that I actually kind of saw and liked, and the Bungie have actually considered cancelling this book to allow players to see Master Chief as a blank slate, and because of the concerns that the book would not sell enough units to be worth the effort, Nyland's editor Eric S. Truman or Trotterman convinced Bungie to approve the book and it carried a dedication to him until it was reissued in 2010 by a different publisher. So I just thought that was cool. That that's how close we got. This book is incredible. Yeah, it really it really is a great novel just from just like a military sci-fi point of view. Like it just like like the time jumps like yeah, we we want to know what happens between it, but like when you condense it down to like these conflicts it all it does is reinforce character and reinforce the conflict with between the Covenant and the UNSC. And then all the way up to the finale, it, it just comes together and just like, man, this is a freaking war that these people are fighting. And then when you throw the game connections into it as well, you just really want to just go play the games. If you're looking to replay all the Halo games before Halo Infinite, start with Halo The Fall of Reach. Read the book. Go play Halo 1. Read first strike and then play the other games. Like that's that's how you're supposed to do it. Yeah, because those those books are amazing at just tying up the, the spaces in between. And this book was so good for just where it went in so many different places to like introducing Halsey keys, the Spartan programs, the kids, the boot camp, what that was like, cutting the augmentations, the armor, the technology, the ships, the space battles ground battles, the even the AI from their Cortana's perspective it seems. Like, this book went so many places. It's fantastic for what it is and where, where it gets you. We all love it. We all tell you to love it. Does anybody want to add anything else in before we wrap? Last thing I'll say about the inconsistencies is just I try not to think too hard about it because if you start thinking too hard about it, it's just... It'll take away your enjoyment. Yeah, over, exactly. Right? Just, like, take it... I mean, this book was written 18 years ago. A lot has been added into the lore that's pretty seamless, like, I think of all of the other stories in the universe, this book might be the one with the most inconsistencies, but it's not a lot to make it, like, to really deter it from the, what the story is and to take your mind off it unless you let it. So, just take it, this is, this is the introduction to the world, and then just go from there and enjoy Halo for what it is after that. It's a wonderful sense of Norn. Okay, guys, let's wrap it up from there. Thank you very much for listening. This has been your Halo Book Club, The Fall of Reach. Yay, 2020 Halo year! Yay. 2020 Halo year. <laughs> Evolved. Evolved. Evolved.